Kära vänner, välkomna till ett mycket intressant seminarium. Jag vill börja med att referera till ett tal som president Thomas Ilves höll i Europaparlamentet. Thomas Ilves, Estlands president, bara för ett par veckor sedan. Uh, yes, that's right. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> so uh, I would like to begin by referring to uh, an address by Thomas Ilves, the Estonian president at the European Parliament, just two weeks ago. He said the following grammatic words. Europe is amidst a transformational crisis, a transformational crisis where we shall put to the test all that Europe has achieved, step by step, since Monet and Schumann. We are approaching a tipping point where either we become stronger or we, or we let vociferous forces prevail. He speaks then about the security crisis. He devotes a lot of attention to data and the use of information technology for economic, social and political purposes in Europe. And he concludes, if we cede to the populists who say that Europe cannot be trusted with her citizens' interests, then no crisis, foreseeable or not, will find an adequate solution, be it migration, the euro, or even military aggression, not to mention the challenge of technological change Solutions that revert to the nation state will bring us back to pre-World War II era. An era where short-termism, beggaring thy neighbor, leads inevitably to a tit-for-tat and a loss for all. Back to an era where once again might makes right. Where that leads, we have seen too many times in Europe's history. For someone on the front line for so many decades like Thomas Ilves, to use these words, speaking to ourselves at the European Parliament, challenges indeed how we in Europe are answering the turbulent times ahead of today. We have seen how institutions are challenged, we have seen how the integrity of the Union itself is losing the trust of its people. We have to have a stronger European policy. To do that, uh, we need to challenge our politicians. We need to see how better we can uh, formulate a European foreign policy. And uh, what better way to do that than to look very closely at the foreign policy of each country, the foreign policy of the European Union itself. Over the past couple of years, uh, the old used, the well-worn tool of naming and shaming has been used before. And we have uh, worked uh, together with the European Council for Foreign Relations in exactly such a review over the past years. It's been very interesting. And today we have uh, an opportunity to hear the latest scoring, how Europe comes through. It's a very interesting report, and uh, uh, we have then a panel which will discuss it, uh, but I will take the panel and present them uh, later on. But first, I would like to introduce Susie Dennison, who is co-director of the European Power Programme. She's a senior policy fellow at ECFR, and she has a background working on the European issues, the global strategy, and particularly, I would also like to mention, in the Treasury, giving a welcome breadth to her international experience. Susie, uh, you have a presentation, so I'll ask you to come up to the podium and present to everyone. Thank you for being here with us. I hope I've switched my microphone on effectively. Thank you very much for that uh, welcome and, and thank you very much to uh, UI for having me here today and for hosting this event um, and for your cooperation in general on the, on the foreign policy scorecard. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, very briefly to, uh, to present to you uh, the results of, of, of this year's project um, and then I'm really looking forward to um, uh, the panel discussion and the Q&A afterwards and hearing others' reactions uh, to, to, to the ideas that we've put forward. 
So very um, briefly to begin with, uh, a few words on what the scorecard is as a project. Essentially, it is an effort to assess uh, systematically and comprehensively the, uh, the EU's performance in achieving its goals in the world. Uh, in, in terms of this project, when we talk about the EU, we do look individually at the contribution of member states, as, as Matt has said in his introduction, and the, the contribution of the institutions. But what we are assessing uh, when we look uh, across six different strategic regions for Europe, uh, and, and specifically 66 policy components, um, is Europe as a whole. How well um, does the collective perform? For each, of the, uh, for each of the policy components, we, we give grades from A to D, um, and these are made up by assessing uh, each component on the basis of unity, to what extent were member states and institutions agreed and united around the policy. Resources, uh, which incorporates both the financial and political uh, contribution, how much time uh, was, was, was spent on the issue. And then strategy and impact. Was the policy well designed? Um, and to what extent did it make a difference on the ground? And then finally, um, on 12 different, um, 12 key uh, uh, foreign policy questions of the year, uh, we've characterised um, different member states as leaders, supporters or slackers. Um, uh, on those questions. To summarise very briefly um, uh, the, the, the different chapters, the, the, the big stories of the year, um, our highest scoring chapter with a B plus is Russia this year. Um, we felt that it was particularly significant in 2015 uh, that EU states held a firm line on Russia in what was an even more challenging global environment than uh, in 2014 when the sanctions policy was first put in place. Uh, clearly by the end of the year, um, uh, the unity, um, at least verbally, around that policy um, was, was, was beginning to um, show some cracks. Um, and whether or not it will hold through 2016 is, is, a, is a key question, I think. Uh, but it was particularly noteworthy that in a year in which um, uh, the, EU's, uh, the EU was faced with um, the ongoing Eurozone cr uh, crisis, uh, talks with Greece in the first half of the year, the refugee crisis, which was growing through the course of the year, but particularly significant in the second half of the year, um, and, and major strategic questions of, across a number of regions, um, Russia became sort of one among several uh, foreign policy challenges, but this policy did stay firm. I think it's also um, significant to note that what, is, what has been uh, for a number of years um, as part of this project, which I should have started by saying we've run now for six years, um, uh, has been our highest scoring chapter, multilateral issues. Uh, this year wasn't the highest scoring. Um, uh, it's still got a B minus overall, um, but the section looking at key elements of the international system, which includes policy at the UN, um, has gone down um, from uh, a B last year to a C plus. Um, this is because of a very mixed year um, uh, for the EU um, in international institutions um, and uh, uh, on the ongoing struggle to coordinate a more effective uh, uh, European policy um, in that forum. Just to run through, um, before we go into more detail on the scores, a number of the key themes uh, that emerged from doing this work this year. The first of those is what we've called a changing balance of power. Um, the EU um, found itself at the Valletta summit with African Union states in the autumn at the EU-Turkey summit in November. It found itself very much in the position of demandeur. Um, because uh, Europe... Um, the, the, the story of the scorecard uh, in, um, over previous years has been the extent to which we were able to um, influence partners, our neighbourhood, uh, and, and further abroad. Um, uh, this year, the story was very much their influence on us. And um, the challenge, the diplomatic challenge which we faced in 2015, uh, was, was, was that of how we can negotiate with these partners um, uh, in a field where... We, we have more to ask than, in some ways than, than to offer. This is not a new trend. This is, um, this is something uh, which I think um, the diplomats have been aware of um, a, 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 as a challenge, not just within the neighbourhood, but more globally, um, uh, th th this shifting balance. But for 2015, it became very prominent. The second threat... Um, sorry, the second trend um, <laughs> that, I, that I want to highlight is that of the the idea of an outward-facing Europe um, seemingly very much under threat in 2015. 
European populations um, across uh, the Union uh, were scared, are scared. Um, they're concerned about their government's um, ability to control what is happening uh, within Europe, um, and they're concerned about security. They're concerned about the pressures um, of migration uh, from the refugee crisis. And the very idea that, um, uh, that one of the best ways to ensure our security is by external engagement, is, what, is by being an outward-facing actor, has, has really come under question um, in, in a number of capitals in, in 2015. Um, uh, and uh, this was particularly striking after the Paris attacks um, in November. Um, but um, it, is, it is not only related to security. There's this um, question around um, uh, a, a wider um, engagement with Europe, which I think is really challenging um, uh, the EU's ability uh, to continue to act. It's not all bad news. There were a number of notable successes in um, 2015. I have highlighted already uh, uh, the Russia story. I think the other noteworthy point is the Iran deal, uh, which was uh, secured um, over the summer and really showed um, the EU at its best, its, its diplomatic best, in terms of the, playing a facilitating, brokering role on, um, on a key strategic dossier. I think it was perhaps disappointing that that same level of diplomatic excellence wasn't deployed in the same way on other con conflicts such as Syria, where we didn't see Europe playing such a strong role, um, and, but which perhaps have an even more direct impact on some of the challenges that we're facing at home. Um, but still, I think um, the Iran deal has far-reaching consequences for our foreign policy. The, the, the fourth uh, trend is that of uh, a diminished faith in political elites and in politics um, uh, more generally. In 2015, European leaders were really being tested at home. Uh, Their the, the growing um, anti-establishment forces um, uh, across Europe um, has generated less political time uh, for foreign policy um, than, uh, than, than many leaders would perhaps have liked. And this um, added to the overall challenge um, of, of, of impact in 2015. And then um, the last two themes are, are linked, really. Um, the idea of a member state-driven Europe and a paradox of German power. To, again, the member state driven Europe isn't something new, it's not something that emerged in 2015, but it became increasingly prominent in 2015. It was clear that, um, that through the Greek crisis and then through the refugee crisis in the second half of the year, uh, it was Germany that kept decision making on the road across an, a range of foreign policy dossiers and in a way that we've seen it playing that role in previous years um, on, on other economic and, and, and financial questions. And uh, for, for, for the early part of the year, that seemed to be welcome um, by other member states. But there was a real turning point around the agreement on relocation of refugees, uh, which, which was never implemented, um, uh, in the autumn, and a growing increasing resentment of the role that, was Germ that Germany was playing in that sense, and, um, uh, and, and the idea that, uh, that uh, policy decisions could be pushed through um, between member states. Um, that, that um, it, it, we've, we've called it a paradox because, in a sense, the leadership which we've been asking Germany for um, suddenly began to raise questions around Europe. And I think that really exposes this idea um, that, uh, that, that the EU is in a very risky place when um, it is so reliant on the leadership of one or more member states, because ultimately that means that the whole EU project um, is, is, is too dependent in some ways to, um, uh, to the domestic situation of the government in, in those leading member states in, in question. Clearly, there were efforts by the Commission, um, by the Council, um, to, uh, to, to bring forward policy solutions on the refugee crisis, but, uh, but we saw very clearly in 2015, and I think this trend has continued into 2016, that, um, that the power uh, for implementation really lies, and the solutions um, for, for, for moving us forward out of these um, linked crises really lie in the hands of Member States. Very briefly, uh, where did we deem Europe's performance um, as have, having been particularly strong? Um, it will come as no surprise from my previous um, presentation that the top scoring 
uh, policies are those linked to the uh, diplomatic measures and sanctions against Russia and those um, uh, and linked dossiers such as diversification of gas supply routes away from Russia um, and also those related to um, the Iran deal and cooperation with the US on Iran. These were all areas um, in which we gave um, the straightforward A grade this year. And again, it will come from no as no surprise from, from what I've said so far that the bottom policies were really about um, security-related questions in the MENA region and also about this question of how we use our influence with uh, key neighbours such, um, uh, such as Turkey, who we really need to cooperate with on the refugee crisis. Uh, this was a year in which um, the EU-Turkey deal um, uh, last November moved, uh, moved the, the, potentially moved the EU-Turkey relationship out of an impasse, but with really very little mention of um, uh, retrenchment on human rights and uh, the, the, the democratic situation in Turkey um, related to freedom of expression and so on, issues which should really be fun fundamental to the, the, propo the, the proposed reopening of the accession process. And then the part uh, which always generates the most in terms of questions and answers, the leaders and the slackers. Um, I should say that this year we focused this process down um, from around 30 questions in previous, quest previous years to 12 questions this year. The idea being that we really wanted to look at the, quest the, the issues which mattered in 2015. Um, uh, we, the, we have had some discussion in previous years around the methodology here that some of the issues that we were looking at were quite significant for some member states, more peripheral to others. Um, so we've really tried to look at the questions which matter to Europe as a whole. And um, uh, again, no surprises that Germany comes out on top. Um, but what I think is more interesting is um, the, the sort of the second layer of, of the leaderboard, um, where we have um, the Netherlands, Sweden and the UK, surprising um, to find, for, for myself coming from London, to find the UK still in that group. Um, but we did find um, that uh, there, there was still a significant um, uh, diplomatic engagement at a working level um, coming out of the UK, which was quite significant in terms of um, driving a number of foreign policy dossiers. In terms of this, the top slackers we have in there, Lithuania and Poland, um, I, one, one point I would like to mention in relation to this is that the issues on which Lithuania and Poland were rated as um, slackers, which include overall troop deployment um, and, um, and also um, aid contributions to the Middle East, um, uh, are areas where these two states were in good company um, uh, in the sense that these were, these were areas of, of strategic underinvestment by Europe as a whole um, uh, and um, and so uh, th 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 these issues along with um, recognition of the importance of human ri rights in the relationship with China were not prioritized by these states but they were also not prioritized by Europe um, as a whole um, I've been asked to say a few more words as as we're in Stockholm on on the Swedish story you'll have seen um, Sweden in the in the um, the, the the second group of, of leaders with, with five leader rankings. The story here probably will come as no surprise to um, those of you who are following Swedish foreign policy quite closely. Uh, the leader rankings are for um, increased investment, sorry, um, continued investment in development aid, keeping it well above the 0.7 uh, target. Prioritisation of human rights in the relationship with China in a year in which we saw a number of member states pull away from that commitment um, uh, and an increasing focus on trade and investment in that particular relationship, um, not at a coordinated European level. Um, and then um, the, the other three uh, leader re rankings are related to um, issues, to, uh, sort of the strategy towards the East. So pushing for a strong and united um, sanctions policy on Russia, uh, ongoing commitment towards um, Eastern partnership countries in the context of that uh, challenged relationship and ongoing support for the Ukraine. I think it's um, fair to say that, um, uh, that the Swedish foreign policy priori priorities which we've recognised here are indicative of a broader uh, group of member states, uh, which include a number of the Baltic states who have um, this, um, this, this concern um, about um, uh, the, the sort of the threat from the east. Um, there are a different group of states which have looked um, more to uh, the south, more to the sort of um, the strategy towards the Middle East, North Africa, 
and in France's case, the sort of um, the, the the further sub-Saharan region. Um, uh, and I think there's an interesting discussion to be had about sort of how the um, EU splits resource on those two fronts. Um, and then finally, just to close, um, uh, a couple of comments about um, what this all means for global strategy looking forward, um, which I think is one of the, the subjects for our, um, our conversation today. I mean, two le lessons I take away from this, this work on the scorecard is, firstly, the importance of member states in developing this global strategy process, um, the sense in which um, for uh, the global strategy to stick, for it to be effective in terms of a framing, uh, shaping uh, exercise for European foreign policy, it, what, what will matter is that you have buy-in and ownership um, around the EU, and in order to get that in the current environment, the global strategy story will need to speak to um, EU citizens uh, and not sort of um, sit above um, the, the, the very real concerns which people are feeling right now. And the second lesson I would highlight is that Europe can't do this on its own. Um, that's, that's, that's what we've seen from the, from the refugee crisis. Uh, that's what we've seen from uh, so many of the conflicts, um, uh, Syria, uh, uh, Libya, elsewhere, that, that we are one among uh, a number of global actors who matter. And our cooperation with these other key actors is absolutely critical. Um, and as part of that, I think that as we move um, towards a new US administration, it's an important moment for the EU to reflect, particularly on the transatlantic relationship, what we want from that um, and, and what we should prioritise um, with the new administration in order to make that global strategy work. So, I think that's enough for me. Thank you. <clears throat> Lucy, will you remain up here, please? Well, thank you. Uh, you know, foreign policy is a lot about competing narratives, sometimes reinforcing uh, narratives, but certainly often competing ones. But uh, if you want to see a whole, it can really help to have a tool. I'm sure your methodology has been challenged and there are competing narratives within that story, as we even could hear from you. But to have something uh, like this, I don't know that uh, I know very many others who have attempted. So I'm glad to hear that. And it's for us to now discuss it. And to do that, to start us off, we have Björn Fagerstein. Maybe you would uh, like to step up here. Björn is very well known to you, but what might not be known to you all is that last week he was appointed new Europe director of a changing and uh, changing uh, for a uh, Swedish Institute for International Affairs. So congratulations to, to you, Björn. You have also been involved with the study over the past uh, couple of, of years and will certainly stay so, but how do you see the story coming out here? How will it impact the prospects for European uh, common foreign and security policy? Um, let us hear your views very much. Thank Welcome. you very much. You hear me? We have new microphones here today. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as I think Susie started out, 2016 is the year when Europe will finally get its new strategy, something that will replace the 2003 European security strategy. Uh, and as you, as you might know, we were been, the UV has been very much involved in this process um, since both 2003-2008, when there was the implementation report, and now in the work with, towards the European global strategy. And when we started this project in 2012, when it was presented by Carl Bildt and Mr. Sikorsky, um, it was critiqued, I think, in Dagens Nyheter, one of our dailies, that w what a weird idea. Why should we start a, a strategic work in the midst of uh, the Eurozone crisis? I mean, you shouldn't negotiate uh, during times of weakness. You shouldn't set objectives uh, when you're as weak as this. The, la the world is laughing at us, so why should you sit and, and formulate a strategy and, and set strategic goals? Um, I think that's a pretty bad argument. It's like having a personal trainer telling you that uh, you shouldn't go to the gym until you're fit. Um, also, it, w it was problematic from a timing perspective. Today we find ourselves probably in an even worse situation. We have an internal crisis that is definitely, or at least as worse as, or bad as 2012, but we also have external crisis mounting. And we have transboundary crisis affecting us both inside the Union and outside of it. Uh, still, we need strategy and we probably need it more today than ever before. So I think that the essence here is that it's never really the right time to write a strategy, but it's always a good time to have it. Uh, and I'm happy this will be the year. 
Now, what can we expect of, of the strategy, but also what can we expect of, uh, from the EU when it comes to strategic action in 2016 based on this uh, report and, and what happened during 2015? I would argue that effective European foreign policy is a product of context, cohesion and capabilities. So based on, on 2015 and what Susie told us now, what, how does it look? If we start with context, this is then the, the surrounding environment which enables or constrains EU action. This is obviously a time where context demands EU action. Uh, we see Russia creating instability in our neighborhood and even war. We have attacks by the Islamic State in Paris. We have a meltdown in Libya. We have the whole migration issue. I think in general we can say that all these crises are very complex. They are interlinked. Uh, they are concurrent. They happen at the same time. So it's very difficult to pick them one by one. We need a big deal or, or more political will to address them at the same time. And that, of course, is very difficult. I would say there are no easy solutions left in Europe. There's no low-hanging fruit in the European security architecture. Um, but still, there is very much a demand for European engagement. And I would say there's also support, especially from the US side, for Europe to engage more. On to cohesion. The ability of relevant EU actors, uh, often the member state, but also the institutions, to come together and work towards a common goal. One of the, the big trends that, that uh, the European Council of Foreign Relations have, have tracked over many years is the kind of renationalization of, of politics in general, but also foreign policy. Uh, and as Susan, I think she put it very well, that this is a problematic uh, with the member states because they essentially, they are, they are of course important and you need their buy-in in any kind of European foreign policy. But they're also very selective when it comes to their interests and they're event-driven. So you lose something if you have a foreign policy that is always, uh, almost always driven by, by member states. And that's, that's an obvious role for the institutions here to kind of provide for these gaps that are otherwise left uh, uncatered for. The second problem with the, the member state uh, is that they are quite often divided. We saw it in the euro crisis, uh, where we both had a kind of north-south divide over economic policy, but also a core periphery gap or divide when it comes to managing these problems, the institutional solutions. And I think we see it today again with the migration crisis. There are talk about the value uh, divide, an east-west divide in Europe today. Um, and I would wonder also when I saw the list of priorities if we also have a kind of attention divide uh, between the north and the south because you look at least in the what you would term the successful areas it's almost all areas that we care for lots about in, in the north of Europe and from for Swedish perspective it looked very good I mean we had the climate change we had Russia like seven out of ten of the successful areas we had solidarity in the security field which is quite important for us as well However, I think that's, that's a pretty dangerous victory, if you would term it like this, because all European foreign policy is based on a kind of compromise uh, with attention. Resources need to go south and east, and, and perhaps also north. Uh, and if you breach that balance, collective action is going to suffer after a couple of years, because you lose that buy-in that Susie was talking about. So that's something to, to look for uh, when it comes to cohesion. I also think this whole conflict between values and interests is, is quite often played out as a problem also for cohesion because member states uh, differ in this respect. I, I don't totally agree and Turkey is often made as a case for, for, for this uh, problem of balancing values and interests, especially with the deal now over migration. I would argue that it's more of a problem between our long-term interest and our short-term interest because on the long-term our values and, and the long-term interests are pretty much the same. Uh, it would be great for us with a fully democratic Turkey without authoritarian tendencies. It would be much better, easier to broker a deal also on common areas of concern. Uh, so that would, that's in our interest and it's in line with our values. But it's really a problem in the long-term perspective and the short-term perspective. My last factor for an effective European foreign policy is capabilities, the resources that any actor uh, have at their disposal for foreign policy. 
And here I think it's, it's interesting compared with the Euro crisis. That's also a crisis when Europe lost uh, a lot of capabilities. The difference is that during the Euro crisis there was also momentum created to actually work together on capabilities. There was lots of agreements or at least talk, but also some action on when it came to pooling and sharing, how we better can use our resources together. Uh, unfortunately, I think now it's pretty clear, especially during the migrant situation, that we're really moving money uh, from foreign policy uh, objectives and strategy to more internal uh, policies. And we see this in the report with the difficulties to fund and man uh, crisis management in North Africa, the failure to support uh, host countries when it, when it comes to migration, for example. And I think this is highly problematic because it's really shifting resources to the, the causes of problem to the symptoms. And that is the very definition of not being very strategic. So to sum up, I think on context, our neighborhood is definitely in need of European engagement uh, and a structured idea of what kind of role the EU should play. And I think the report shows us that very well. The bad news is that both cohesion and capability has suffered in 2015. Um, and that today we are pretty far from a collective strategic action uh, on key areas of common interest. The good news, of course, is that these issues, pinpointing common European interests and having better resource allocation is really what you have a strategy for. Um, so, so it's good that we will have one in 2016 and uh, we can only wish Mogherini good luck and it's time to get the EU back into the gym so it gets fit. Thanks a lot, Jan. <laughs> well, uh, I'm not sure uh, whether the two next speakers are in the gym or themselves the fitness trainers, but they have surely both of them taken and are taking responsibilities. Uh, Karin Enström, you've been Minister of Defence, now you are Vice Chair of the, uh, uh, the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament and spokesperson for the moderates. Let us hear your advice how to get Europe and surely ourselves in better shape as well. Please come forward. Well, thank you, and thank you for uh, both inviting me and for holding this um, seminar on a very important uh, issue. Um, and uh, I don't know, well, it was quite high expectations for me now to give advice, what exactly to do, not just only in the gym, but also in reality. Um, uh, but I think I'll start with a couple of comments, because I think... Um, um, in these days, and I don't have to elaborate too much to you, uh, to this audience, on how many challenges, that's a very nice word of telling how many problems or how, ma how, how um, much pressure there is on Europe and on Europe's um, national states and member states these days. So we all know that we, exactly as it's... Uh, uh, noted or stated in the invitation, um, we are surrounded by more or less a ring of fire at, or at least a ring of challenges and problems. And uh, the European Union has been in constant crisis management, at least and since uh, 2008, since the, the start of the, uh, the finance crisis, and then we have had the euro crisis, uh, and there has been one crisis after another. Uh, and during this time, to be able to try to lead or to form um, a coherent um, foreign policy, that's, that's quite an endeavor. So if, and I have to ask Susan about that, if, um, if the overall grades have, well, uh, decreased a little bit, fallen a little bit, maybe that's not so strange since the, I would say, the challenges and the problems are greater than ever. And then to keep focus uh, on how to then keep the Union united and how to find new proposals and new ways to meet all these challenges, that's quite an effort. Um, but these days it's, it's, eas it's easy to forget that I mean, few could predict the enormous success story that really EU is. And we, we mustn't forget that. We are so focused now on challenges and on risk of, uh, of having the union really, well, falling apart. Uh, not at least to mention the, uh, 
the question of Brexit. I don't like that word since that in a way says that this is this is already a matter of fact or, or facts on the ground. Uh, uh, so it's it's always difficult to predict both successes uh, but also failures. Uh, so the optimism that we had was really fulfilled by the European project as a as a defender of peace, of stability, of human rights. Uh, and in this these times of, of having the core values really challenge, the core values of EU, they are under attack, both outside from this ring of fire that we have seen, but also from within. We see a lot of countries now having, well, more or less coming back to nationalistic perspective, uh, to protect their interest. Uh, we have the growth of uh, xenophobic political parties and uh, and also more isolate, isolating well, policy that would, would um, argue for to try to isolate, not to be a part of the European Union. Uh, so one of my um, conclusion is that, well, we need Euro well, a well-functioning European Union now more than ever before. And the big question then is how to get there, how to do this. And for Sweden, being a small country, extremely dependent on exports and um, cooperation, uh, international cooperation, um, for us it's even more important than it is for maybe larger countries. They can manage better uh, on their own, but we cannot. And I think one, one of the, the factors of being successful is that we have been able to build allies, to build, um, well, to meet like-minded uh, nations, trying to find good proposal, new policies. Uh, and we were one of the driving forces to have a new security agenda. And I think that's extremely important because we really do have to spend a lot of time both in the gym, but also, of course, out at the running course um, or, uh, or, um, or maybe at the high, high jump uh, course as well. Um, in this um, scorecard, and I mean, it's, it's interesting now to see, since it's not the first time, it's the sixth time, that Sweden is still uh, among the leaders and not among the slackers. Uh, and that would, uh, of course, be a good argument to say that, well, now we have changed government, so look, maybe we would be among the slackers. But for the sake of, of, of uh, Sweden and its population, I'm, I'm really glad that we still are among the leaders. And of course, we have to watch this very carefully, since it's not something that's come, it's not a given fact that Sweden would be among the leaders. And I think we really have to work hard together to stay among the leaders. Because it's not just going to, to well, the nice summits uh, and the, the different European Council meetings and say good things. You have to really work hard. Uh, and hopefully that's something that also uh, the Council have, has measured. How do the different nation uh, or member states work, um, how can I say, a little bit, well, uh, below or under the radar. Uh, how to find then these like-minded people, how to find a new proposal, how to find these uh, small subgroups, uh, because we know that they are really important when you are trying to change policy or even strengthen uh, policy. Um, and I must say that I'm, I'm really happy that one of the top achievements is the, the policy towards Russia regarding sanctions and regarding to have a very, very strong voice. That our policy as a union uh, is still very firm against Russia. Uh, and um, from the Swedish perspective, this has been, I think it was a top priority for the former government. It is still a top priority uh, from 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 the present government and uh, that you cannot you haven't been able to see any change there there's been a very firm stand on how we see the annexation of crimea and uh, the aggression uh, towards uh, ukraine um, 
And of course, we are, and this should be reflected in the report, in the scorecard, that we are still very firm on keeping the 1% goal in international development aid, since that's something that we have been doing as a tradition. Uh, it's also an example for the rest of EU and the world that we are still keeping this in focus. Uh, but of course, there are also then problems, both for Sweden uh, as a member state and for the EU. Um, except from the Iran deal, which was of course uh, a wonderful achievement. Uh, but we haven't been able as a union to, um, how can I say, to have enough pressure on the UN Security Council uh, to be able to do something uh, about Syria. And I think that's uh, one of the um, one of the um, legacies that we will suffer from, and those who have been suffering the most is, of course, the the Syrian people, the Syrian refugees. But that's quite a heavy legacy to be a part of. And hopefully, we have seen now some kind of light in the tunnel with the uh, with the latest uh, developments uh, between U.S. the U.S. and Russia. Um, just a couple of words on the strategy. I think it's really, really, um, uh, I would say it's necessary for the union to be successful and to come forward on different areas of policies to have a strategy. And maybe it's, it will not be easy. Maybe it will be, uh, the result will be a compromise as always. But that's also one of the strengths that the EU has, that we are used to make compromises but we won't let um, uh, that be an obstacle because uh, the member states, they can carry on with this quite, I don't know, day-to-day, -day, not that glamorous work, as I mentioned in, in, the, in, my, in the beginning, that the EU has um, the advantages of being um, an organization that can in a, not carry on maybe, but work together until we're done. Uh, and the result will be a compromise, but there is, in the end, always an, a, res a result. Um, and hopefully, we could use the strategy to then make a new scorecard and then maybe compare the strategy with the results in the scorecard. That's what I'm looking forward to next year. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, surely we need progress, so... Um, Annika, Annika Söder, State Secretary for Political Affairs in the Foreign Ministry, diplomat and multilateralist. Tomorrow you will present the foreign policy declaration of the, or the minister will, uh, in Parliament of the Swedish government. But maybe you can foreshadow the messages. <laughs> no, you cannot. <laughs> but let us see what conclusions you draw from the presentations. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mats. And I cannot, unfortunately, reveal what will be said in the, in the foreign policy debate to tomorrow, but I strongly recommend it. I think it will be webcasted and you will also be, then be able to listen to Karin uh, again. Um, thank you for this opportunity and many thanks to the other speakers also for very useful uh, interventions. Of course, we are very happy that uh, we scored high also this time. In all fairness, it should be said that also the former government scored high because the scores from last year were, were mainly the achievements of the, of the former government. And I think this is also an important factor to mention that we have a lot of uh, disagreements, but we have a deep uh, understanding uh, in the parliament on EU uh, foreign policy matters and this is extremely important since um, EU is our main belonging. Of course the Nordic countries are very very important and this is a very long uh, family tradition uh, but our uh, main belonging is the European Union because this is also where we can uh, uh, seek our security. Uh, of course, scorecards are always funny, uh, and it's uh, uh, interesting to be measured, uh, and I think Susie made a very important statement that this is not uh, covering all fields. 
uh, there are fields that are not mentioned and there are fields that may uh, merit to be mentioned and I think the, the ECFR work on this is, uh, is a very honest and good one. Uh, uh, not, anyway, we are very happy to be, uh, to having, to have been scoring well on so many different issues and even more importantly not to be a slacker in anyone uh, I don't know if you saw that but we we are engaging in most fields and I think this is not only Swedish tradition but also another reflection of how we seek uh, security and good relations that we we work uh, in many ways and with with many actors um, Scoring member states uh, is, of course, also to, in a way, uh, underline the individual achievement and not the total achievement. So I think the the results of ECFR's work when it comes to the total achievement of the European Union may be more important than the individual score of the individual countries. So that we do not move uh, and work for individual results, but actually for the results of the entire uh, European Union. Um, it's very clear, and it has been said, it has been very difficult uh, for the European Union as a whole uh, to uh, rise to the challenges related to the turbulent developments in our neighbourhood. Uh, we face so many uh, challenges related to conflicts and insecurity. Uh, and when we look at this, we should also remember that further away uh, on the globe, we see progress still happening and we have maybe a more peaceful Latin America than we've had in many, many years. Uh, so we live in this ring of fire, as uh, was said, but we should also remember positive developments in other parts of the world. And this may also be related to the, the important changes that we are living through. Uh, that we have foreseen a paradigm shift for a long time. We've seen the BRICS countries uh, playing a more important role now. Their economies are sort of going down, but still we live through major changes. And I may dare to quote the outgoing president of the African Union, uh, President Mugabe of Zimbabwe. I listened to him two weeks ago uh, where, when he spoke to all the leaders of the African Union and he said that you should note uh, that now India is uh, 1.2 uh, uh, billion people, China also more than 1 billion. Soon we in Africa will be 2 billion. And remember that in Europe there are only 500 million and I don't think that these uh, white-faced and pink-nosed people <laughs> will be in the lead of the world uh, anymore. So this is the southern perspective and this is what the European Union uh, should be very much aware of that when it comes to population, when it comes to, eco to economic development and when it comes to social development, and I'll come back to that, uh, we should both look after our own interests but also see to it that we work very closely with other actors that are important for, for several uh, reasons. Uh, maybe I should say for clarity that I do not agree with the, with the picture <laughs> that President Mugabe uh, made, but I think it's an important uh, reflection. This takes me to the internal challenges because we cannot build a strong foreign policy if we do not have a unity and if we do not have trust between countries in the European Union, with the institutions of the European Union and from the people and the peoples of the European Union. And uh, I must say that I'm quite pessimistic when it comes to the situation that we live through presently uh, with uh, xenophobic tendencies, with some countries changing their uh, rules in a direction that is not in full compliance with, the, with what is expected uh, from members of uh, the European Union. We need to counter xenophobia in most of the countries uh, of the European Union and we still have to deal with the consequences of the economic crisis. But this is also on an optimistic note in a way because we showed that we were able to deal with the economic crisis and many of the countries that, uh, that suffered 
strongly from it now are uh, recuperating in a, in a very important way. But it's very clear that the well-being and, and the welfare and the security internally is extremely important for uh, the way we can portray uh, our role uh, globally. Um, a concern here is of course the rule of law and human rights and the way uh, we deal with what we've been preaching for decades when it comes to being the major actor in favour of the universal values, the foundation of the UN, the foundation of the, of the European uh, Union. Um, and we see tendencies now, uh, among other reasons, I think with the refugee and migration crisis, that the values the role that the values play in the discourse in, in Europe um, is unfortunately less important than before. Uh, we see fewer uh, European countries preaching human rights to other countries in the world and this is very uh, worrying uh, because we need to stick together uh, on our values. We need to work on them internally in order also to be able to talk about them externally but we see less of that. We see the institutions, they do that. Some countries do that, one of them is Sweden, there are others. Uh, but for economic reasons many countries now refrain from bringing this issue up and I think this is very worrying. Um, there are of course, when we look at foreign policy actions, some have been mentioned. The, the negotiations with Iran uh, are very important, the results important, and though we have turbulence in the region now, partly also because of concerns from neighbors of Iran, uh, I hope that uh, the actions taken there by the European Union together with others will play a positive role when it comes to how, uh, we, how developments will turn out in the Syria negotiations uh, and in order for us to deal with the root causes uh, of the refugee uh, crisis. Um, let me also say a few words about the global strategy as, as uh, Bjorn did. The foundation of course for a global strategy will have to be the internal um, situation, economy and values, as I mentioned, uh, the support from people to what we're doing, uh, and the realization of how many factors that play in. And I think what we have seen now with the drafts of the global strategy is encouraging in several ways because it takes into account energy, climate, uh, migration, as I mentioned, and they are now, uh, I think, to all of us, very clear features of reality, not only concepts that researchers uh, work on. So we really need to look at them when we work on the global strategy. Uh, the world developments are also contributing to this because as we see the world being quite unable to deal with peace and security matters, we've mentioned several of, the, of them. Some other um, areas are making progress. Uh, I'm thinking of the COP21, the Paris Agreement on Climate. I think of important um, achievements in the WTO round taken in Nairobi in December, the financing for development agreement that the world w was able to, to make uh, in uh, July last year and the Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, as a matter of fact, 193 leaders agreed on goals for all fields of development. And if we were to implement this, we would solve most of the, prob uh, of the problems. The European Union is very well placed to deal also with all these issues internally as well as externally. Uh, I have some concerns, again, with the EGS, as we say, the European Global Strategy. Again, this is about the values and human rights, rule of law and uh, democracy. Uh, we've seen a word feature, and that is 
pragmatic idealism and we do not see that as a way forward. We think that could undermine uh, dealings with the surrounding world uh, that would be guided by international law, international humanitarian law, the right of asylum and uh, basic uh, principles. What is good in the draft strategy is how we uh, put forward the European security order, um, the challenges from Russia with its aggression against Ukraine and that we need to deal with this in a joint fashion. Uh, what is also there is uh, the discussion on a two-track approach to Russia and I think this discussion is one of the most difficult and one of the most important ones that the European Union, uh, Union uh, will embark on already before the strategy is adopted this um, this spring. Uh, so let me finalize by saying that since the European Union is our most important platform and since it can continue to be a global actor, uh, we appreciate that ECFR is working on uh, measuring uh, what we're doing uh, and that we will continue to be, try to be a very good actor in uh, unity with the other political parties. Thank you. Thank you. Well, despite, despite what you said, I bet some of that will be seen tomorrow. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm now going to turn uh, to the audience, so please sharpen your, your questions. It's striking how aligned your approaches uh, are. Your narratives are very similar. Per perhaps if I let you talk, you'd, you'd hammer out some some differences and nuances, but uh, rather than do that, I'd like to give some space to this very well-informed audience. So, uh, please, uh, who would like to challenge perhaps the findings or the story of the matter at hand, this analysis, or any one of the comments that have been there already? Who would like to? This is seldom an audience that you have to <laughs> ask to speak first. Here's one. If you would just please be 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 brief and and direct, and if you like, present yourself. Yes, I'm Jorge Navarro, international correspondent, and I would like to ask to Susie, what's exactly your foundations for this scorecard? It looks like a little subjective, and how you choose the subjects that you are referring to. Thank you. There was one behind you there, Ilva, I believe. No? No? We usually like to take a few questions at the same time. Susie, while they think, why don't you answer that question? Okay. Um, I'm going to switch my microphone back on. Um, yes, the, essentially the foundation um, for the scorecard is um, the, the EU's stated goals in relation to each of the regions that we're looking at. So we took a decision at the beginning of this project that it didn't make sense for us to, um, to decide uh, uh, what those goals should be. And in that sense, um, one of the, the shortcomings, if you like, of, of the scorecard is that it doesn't, um, it doesn't take a view on whether or not um, the goals are the right ones. In, at least in the scoring system. Um, uh, but we do obviously comment on that in the overall narrative um, and, and, and some of the chapter introductions. Um, the, but that said, um, there is, I guess, what you've termed um, a, an element of subjectivity in terms of the regional covered coverage. We have looked at um, five strategic regions for the EU and um, and then uh, one thematic chapter, which is the multilateral and crisis management issues. I think it is um, a fair criticism um, that within those kind of immediate strategic um, regions, we don't cover Latin America. One of the other um, uh, areas uh, which we sometimes get criticism for is, um, is insufficient regional coverage of Africa. That is looked at quite extensively in the multilateral and crisis management um, uh, chapter, um, but uh, the sort of the, the broader engagement beyond crisis with Africa is, is, is perhaps something which, um, uh, which over the long longer term it would be good um, to develop. Um, that is um, sort of 
partly a, a, a function of um, the horizon scan that we did when we started this project in, I think it was 2009. Um, uh, uh, and um, it's also partly a function of the way that we're structured as ECFR in terms of our regional expertise. Um, just um, to, to comment briefly as well on um, whether or not um, we're sort of nationally subjective um, or uh, regionally subjective in terms of the scores we give, uh, we have a number of checks and balances within the process. There are over 40 researchers who are involved in the project. Um, so that's 28 across all of the different um, uh, member states who are looking at how uh, foreign policy is developed in, in that country and how that contributes to the European whole. Um, and then there are um, uh, more than six um, regional experts contributing to the components and chapters. Um, that says somebody has to take responsibility for kind of pulling them together and uh, cross-checking where there are disagreements between the regional and the uh, national perspectives. That's me and then the core team. Um, so if you have sort of cr criticisms on um, specific aspects um, in terms of where we've come out, then ultimately uh, I have to take responsibility for that. Um, but the idea of, of that, uh, that broad team is to try to, um, to mediate against um, uh, too much subjectivity in the process and to, to make it as um, fair as possible. And uh, thank you for that response. In, within the five chapters, you have actually 68 different subcategories that you look at. And within each of them, you look at unity, strategy, resources, and impact, which makes it a lot of data that you look at to try to bring together. So interesting approach. All right, here is another question. Um, and I look through the audience to see what more I can capture. Please. Thank you, Mats. Also Smedler, I am a former UN staff member. And I would, uh, of course, it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to make comments on the report since it is not available to us, which is normally the case when you present this uh, It is report. available, slide It's on our side. OK. Uh, That'll be fun. Uh, however, I would like to put a question to Annika Söder. Uh, given that uh, this government is a feminist government and a feminist foreign policy is uh, uh, an, uh, something very new in this, these challenging times. So I would like to have comments on that from, from, from all of you, but in particular from the State Secretary. Okay. Can we pass the mic there as well? Catch one more question. Uh, my name is Ingmar Ulberg at the uh, Institute of International Affairs. I'd like to ask you uh, uh, how serious do you think the uh, uh, division between East European and West European member states uh, is concerning the uh, question of uh, uh, reception of uh, refugees? Uh, uh, there is a clear division there. And how do you think this crisis can be uh, over, uh, overcome? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kai Aida. I'm Norwegian ambassador in, in Stockholm. And just to follow up on, on that question, which I think is key, and both Annika Söder and Karin Enser mentioned the threat that core values in Europe are under from within. Um, and with the lack of strong European institutions that can lead, and the fact that you have one politician, in fact, who is leading herself under threat uh, from political opposition, how do you see these trends turn? And how do you propose as Swedish policymakers to go about it, to contribute to that. Thank you. Thank you. Annika, would you like to go first on the gender issue? But even mm. Susie, you might want to comment on, on that one from your perspective. And then colleagues may pick up the general issues on migration and values and institutions. Thank you. Um, as far as I know, ECFR has not mentioned uh, uh, equality between men and women or, or, or feminist issues, but I can, uh, I can tell you about one achievement that we had last year. We proposed to have a gender advisor high up in the system to the vice uh, president, uh, high representative, Mrs. Mogherini, and we got a lot of support from other countries uh, and with us in the lead this uh, 
gender advisor is now uh, in, uh, working and uh, she's already making progress. I, I had already thought of suggesting for the upcoming scorecards to actually look at gender equality matters as, as one uh, uh, possible uh, feature. Mats, do you want me to... Yeah, why don't you continue as okay. well? Uh, on the East, West and refugees. This is almost a philosophical question. Uh, the, many of the countries that are concerned about receiving uh, refugees are newcomers to the European Union. They left systems that were not open and generous not uh, very long ago. Uh, and their uh, populations may need more time to understand that it's actually possible to bring in new people and uh, that this will actually enrich uh, enrich their countries. Uh, since we're, we're at this topic, we need, I would like to say that we need more partnerships uh, in the European Union on the entire situation when it comes to migration and, and the refugee crisis. Of course we need to deal with the root causes. We could do much more, I think, even if it's difficult in the Syrian uh, context uh, and also when it comes to the reasons for people uh, fleeing in North Africa and the Sahel region. We need also to look at the entire system for uh, migration and asylum in the European Union. We could work more with resettlements, namely to use the UN system also to bring people into Europe and in that way also avoid people uh, having to use uh, the sea to get to, uh, to Europe. And of course we, the Swedish government, will work very hard to continue to discuss, including with the member countries uh, to the east, about the shared responsibility and we can see some successes so the the picture is not uh, uh, entirely homogeneous uh, there are at least three or four countries uh, among the newcomers in the european union that are now open to receiving uh, more refugees and i think this is a very a very important step uh, forward um, when it comes to Kaye, this question about core values and the institutions, I think you have a very important point there that when we see um, a situation that is uncertain and unstable, uh, we also see institutions being weakened. The, the lack of trust to the political elites was mentioned here as a factor and this I think is also something something that we see countries act on in relation to the institutions. And for us who have been in the UN for a long time, we could also say that we, you, we can see that the Secretary General is weak if the leading powers do not want him to be uh, a strong, or her, to be a strong person. So maybe the, the, the role of the institutions today are, are what some actors uh, would want, or it's a result of the lack of trust that we have seen uh, over the last 10 years or so in the in the system. And this is, of course, has to be it has to be remedied in one way or or the other. But it's a very very difficult question to to answer if you want to keep the cohesion or get back to the cohesion of of the union. We need strong institutions, but then all. Uh, all countries of the Union will also have to want uh, strong institutions and we will, to be, will have to be ready also to go for common solutions. As, and that is why I mentioned initially that maybe, mem maybe uh, measuring individual member states would make us even more individualistic and this is not what we need, what we need now. We need to look out and we need to be very, be very aware of the situation in in uh, in other parts of the of the world and in of course in our vicinity, but also to work better together. Susie, would you like to take at least the gender issue, but maybe you'd, the other ones trigger yes. some comments from you as well? Yes, I mean, um, uh, I, t I totally agree on on, on both issues uh, with with what the Secretary of State has just said. I. Um, uh, 
I'm not um, a specialist on uh, feminist foreign policy, um, and uh, as has been highlighted, um, this is not something that we've looked specifically um, in the scorecards this year. It could be a subject for, um, for, for future work indeed, but what I would say is that I think uh, it is absolutely critical um, that, uh, that the EU's foreign policy projects our shared uh, values, which, uh, as has been said, are somewhat embattled within the union at the moment, um, also uh, perhaps more contested than ever in, in, in our relationships around the world. Um, but I think um, that, that precisely the, the wrong uh, response to, to that difficult environment is to is to take a step back from them. I think that um, uh, in all partnerships it's clear, um, and, and the scorecard shows us this, that um, Europe is respected uh, where where we are where we are firm about what we stand for, um, and that has a read across um, in, in all policy areas, and, 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 and so in, th in that sense I, I think it's, um, it, it's absolutely crucial. Um, on the east-west um, division uh, in terms of reception of refugees, again I, I agree completely with what's been, been said before on this. I did feel somewhat ashamed saying this in Stockholm as someone coming from London, but I think um, the situation that we're facing uh, in terms of the refugee crisis across Europe is... Is, is huge, but it is manageable at a European level. Um, the, the, the reason that it is pro proving so challenging and divisive now is precisely because um, of, of what we're seeing in terms of um, reversion uh, to, 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 to the national lev level um, across Europe and, and a lack of contribution from a number of member states, my, my own, the first among those, um, uh, in terms of their response to this crisis. My own view is that... Um, that the way forward has to be around a sort of uh, a concept of burden sharing where different member states can play different roles uh, and by that I mean um, burden sharing which un encompasses um, uh, the, the, the foreign policy uh, dimension diplomatic and financial contribution to that um, as well as um, uh, encompassing um, reception uh, uh, in terms of numbers but also um, support uh, in terms of human and financial uh, resources across the EU, uh, which might mean uh, the creation of a sort of a common asylum fund, which some member states uh, with different uh, political cultural histories, such as the, the, the Visegrad group, who have expressed such strong concerns about um, uh, refugee intake, might contribute to financially. Um, but I think that what has to be clear is that every member state does need to play their part, otherwise this really is a crisis which, um, which is going to the very heart of, of, of what the EU is for. And I think that's one of the, the most challenging questions which, which the EU is facing at the moment, that um, if, it, if it can't provide solutions um, uh, th through this crisis, then, uh, then, then many in member states are sort of asking the same questions as, 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 as those in the UK uh, ha have been asking, and, and I think that really is a worry. Well, you mentioned UK just in a way that uh, the uh, Brexit challenge hasn't been more mentioned by you. Karin, of course, mentioned it, but the compromise itself uh, that was just um, discussed and agreed within the European Union, is it weakening us? Is it strengthening us? Where will it go? Do we really realize how dangerous the situation is? It, will there be a contagion? Um, there are many issues that could be discussed on this as well. But Karin or Bjorn, would you like to comment on these issues while I look for more hands here? O on the on, any, on, on uh, of course, uh, the, the questions that um, arose. Well, there are all the three questions are, are uh, of course, um, very important. Um, but maybe I would like to comment on, on number second and number third. Uh, I really would like to add regarding the number one and the, and the gender advisor at a very high level. I think that's very important and I, I'm happy for, for this achievement. And hopefully we'll see results uh, soon, uh, but I'm sure that we will see some results. Uh, of, it's really troublesome with the division uh, within. Uh, if you see that um, several EU member states well, start to deviate uh, both in policies, but also in in handling or or respecting uh, our common values. That was the, I mean, that was the f the foundation. That what was what they promised uh, when they entered the union. That was the aim of all their efforts in in well making their laws and their 
uh, all their systems of justice and so legislation and so on, that they had really to respect the criteria for even entering the European Union. And then it's of course very, very problematic and troublesome when we see that you as a member can start to, well, not respect all, uh, all and every um, law or everything that you promised. Um, there are a lot of, um, you, you can explain maybe all these fears. It's, it's, you can explain it. There are reasons for it. Why did it, uh, why are they reacting uh, the way they are? But that's, um, that's logical, uh, but it's, it's not a defense. It's not a really good argument for not uh, taking their uh, part of the burden. So I think we, we have to work with, uh, with them and try to understand how you can deal with this, uh, why you should deal with this, and what are the advantages? Are there any, uh, can, you, can you win something from this? Can you gain from this uh, at the end of the day? And yes, of course you can. If we do it together in an orderly way, in an orderly fashion, then it's something that can be positive for the whole uh, union. Um, but this also, um, affects um, what, um, uh, what the third question is about, the lack of, uh, of faith, the lack of trust, uh, the lack of strength, uh, maybe from, well, from the leadership, uh, from the institutions, but it's all a reflection of the same thing. When you start to lose faith, then you see all the problems, all the challenges, and you start to think, well, maybe this is not manageable, so maybe we'll do better uh, on our own. And that's a very dangerous path, uh, I think, to, to go further down to or to choose that avenue. Um, so also there, we all do have to um, contribute that this will not be uh, the developments or the future. But it's, um, but I do, do agree on, the, um, on pointing out that this is uh, really troublesome for the whole union. Thank I don't you. have the solution, unfortunately, <laughs> today. I'll come back tomorrow in the debate. <laughs> Björn, would you like to comment or? Yeah, well, there's been so so many good answers. So if I may, I think I'll add another question instead. Uh, first, just feminist foreign policy. We have an analysis coming out uh, very soon here at UV, so check our webpage for that. You'll get all your answers. Um, now, listening to our uh, politicians here, representatives of the, both the former and the current government, uh, you are obviously very well aligned here on, on, on quite a few policy areas and on, on Sweden's role in the EU. I can't help to, to question, uh, both the current and the former government were um, very well at not uh, ending up in the slacker list, uh, and you said this yourself. Is that only positive? I mean, uh, being a slacker in this sense is is uh, taking care of your national interests. Uh, being a slacker in some areas, if national interests are threatened, and being a leader in other areas where you really have strong interest in a in a common European solution, that is what some countries would call a strategy. Um, so this habit of Sweden always ending up as a as a leader and a supporter and never ever on, on the slacker list is that only positive. I think in the in, in game theory, you, you call an actor who, who constantly pay uh, a price, uh, like an unproportional price for a common solution, a sucker. Uh, so we are obviously a, a nation not of suck uh, slackers, but are we a nation of suckers? That would be my question to both of you. The second uh, short question is also uh, another interpretation of these good uh, numbers that we get year after year. Isn't it also, doesn't it say something about our kind of lack of alternatives? Like this is our forum. As you said, this is our, our, our platform. Uh, but isn't that also kind of the, the answer to, to these questions? We're not in NATO uh, yet. We're not in the Union Security Council yet. Uh, we're not in the G20. This is our forum. This is where we invest, whether it's good or bad, because it's, that's where we are represented. And that's part of the answer to why we get these good grades. Well, let's pass the question on. Can't leave that one hanging. Bjorn, Bjorn already answered it, so. Yeah, sorry. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you want to say something? Well, well um, well, Jan, you sound a little uh, Russian here, seeing things as a zero game sum, uh, because I don't, I don't see the the really. If it's not, um, it's not uh, well counterproductive to be uh, to be not to be a slacker. I think if it's a lack of priorities, 
well then maybe but I don't think it is so I don't see this well it's not it's it's more a win-win situation it's not a zero-sum uh, game can I, can I ask as a follow-up where did you did you have anywhere in mind that you'd have liked to have seen Sweden slacking that you think it would have been strategic to do so because I've just been flicking through the only area I can sort of see a case is maybe economic relations with Asia where you could argue that uh, you know, if you had a very narrow view of the national interest, you might want to. Yeah, a good question. No, I haven't really thought of any pet. Uh, we'll think of we areas. We'll think of that next time. Yeah. It's a fair enough challenge. Matt, can I, I, you can I, come yes, back I, I, will, I would like to comment. I, uh, Sweden, uh, as was said, is a small country. Uh, we are, we have a very high export dependency. We have a huge development uh, cooperation. So we have two reasons to be very active in most areas outside of the European Union. Also since, as Björn said, and as I said before as well, since European Union is our, our most important platform, it's also natural to show other partners, to show Spain, Portugal and Italy that we also care about North Africa, that North Africa is also our neighborhood because we are a member of the, of the European Union. Uh, so all of the fields I can that has been that have been looked at. I, I can detect a Swedish interest. Then the other uh, layer of the answer may be that we actually managed to fool <laughs> the researchers that we are not <laughs> as active as as they found. That we are good good diplomats and that we can have a level of activity that that shows this interest that is so important for us both economically and security wise. Uh, I'm sure that hearing all of this, your methodology will develop and you'll yep. get at us. I'm taking notes. Yes, yes please. Thank you. Uh, first time, back on day, the city of Linje. I am uh, Anders Birner, an ex-ambassador. Um, I want to, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised about the very uh, nice uh, attitude towards the, the EU at present. In my view, and having followed the European uh, foreign and security policy and being actually part of it down in Brussels once, um, I think it's an extremely serious crisis situation. It's, I mean, it, it's not just, uh, it's a bit uh, worse now, but it's an extremely, and that has developed, of course, uh, uh, during the past couple couple of, of years, it's, it's not. But my question is: uh, in firstly, it's to to Susie. In your study, uh, do you also go into the reasons for why EU has uh, failed in 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 various ways, or is it just to say uh, you are scoring towards the various goals that the EU has had? And, and I'm thinking, um, uh, for example, about Syria, I think is an ex extreme failure of the EU. We're not even part of this, what is it called, the six, six group or, or something uh, like that. Although we have very, very strong interests in Syria. Uh, why, why is it? And my question is, is of course, we have heard about the, the, the uh, renationalization of the member states. but. What about the institutions? What, what about the disagreements between the Commission and the Council? What about the role or non-role of the high representatives, about the President, etc.? How about the institutions? I don't know, this is, might be outside the, the discussion here, but I, I, I just do, do wonder. We are, not, we are not more crisis conscious than I, at least, here. here. Uh, I'll let the panel do a final round uh, in answering these very broad questions, but uh, here you go, sir. Uh, I'm also a very retired Swedish diplomat, uh, but, uh, but I would like to question why in these discussions about catastrophes we, we have no strategy for long-term conflict prevention, dialogue and values development. Uh, I think that is a, a subject very absent in, in this matter. On feminist foreign policy, I think Annika Söder could have mentioned that in Stefan de Mistura's Syria team, uh, there is now a first Swedish woman, Birgitta Alani, as a member. Thank you. Thank you. 
I could take one more question before the final round of comment, but if there is none, I okay. Here we go. One, just a quick one. Then I'll go in. Uh, my name is Horvath Kapadia. I think. And yes, please. Um, a short question. What's why? Why is everybody so scared that Britain will leave EU? I'm a British citizen myself. I'm very disgusted with the, uh, the way my country is behaving, and uh, the non kind of things that Cameron has brought up now. I think it should just say, okay, fine, leave, and see what happens, because we are going to have this problem all the time with the Britons now, especially with Boris Johnson, if he becomes <laughs> prime minister. Okay, thanks for the challenge. Shall we reverse the order and uh, in final comments? Annika, would you like to, or whoever would go uh, like? Yes, I can start. Yes, okay. Uh, the crisis of the European Union, I think, is deep, and I mentioned several of the features that, uh, that show this, uh, including uh, there is reason for concern when it comes to the, the way the institutions work, at least the EAS and the member states' relation to EAS. And this is something that we also often discuss in, in, in Parliament. Um, so what is the future of the European Union? This uh, thinking has started again, as it always does when we have a crisis. The crisis that the EU has been in earlier were not as deep as this one. So there is now reason to really look into the future. And work has started in several capitals. We've started ourselves uh, with looking at discussions in think tanks and in, in uh, ministries and governments to see where, uh, the, w what kind of tendencies we, we can detect. And we are doing some soul searching ourselves uh, as well. It's of course dangerous to start this work if it leads to um, a movement that is not, again, supported by, by the people. So we start in a very difficult environment, but still we need to do this homework and we need to look at the future role of, of the European Union without, uh, without I, I believe, um, being at this stage to... Um, explicit about where we're going. It's more a matter of actually discussing the crisis and uh, its depth. Um, the issue of conflict prevention is actually mentioned in the global strategy. And this is a very broad and deep theme that we have taken on and will look into also in the coming years, both when it comes to the European Union and generally uh, in order to see what can be done. Um, and of course, Birgitta Alani is an important uh, person in, uh, uh, and professional in Stefan de Mistura's team, but that is not the European Union, and we have few women at leading, in leading positions in the European Union, I'm afraid. Finally, about the UK. Uh, in this um, very challenging situation of the European Union, if the UK were to leave also in addition to all the other aspects. Uh, I believe that uh, the soul searching that I mentioned will, would have to be even more uh, uh, active and in depth. Um, we are not fully happy with all uh, the agreements that we made with the, Euro with the UK. We believe it's important that they stay on. We have also many issues where we have a very close partnership with, with the UK. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the, what is important now is, of course, to support a uh, yes. Uh, I think we, we need the, the UK more in and then out, both because of, of the role it can play and because of uh, the fact that it's not good for the European Union now to have to, have to deal with this as well. Well, then you'll have to learn the word Frexit, I guess. Um, <laughs> Please. Thank you. Um, I'll start with UK. Well, um, no, I don't think that EU would uh, gain. Uh, I think uh, EU without the UK would be, uh, um, well, uh, uh, a less good EU. And I think also for, for Sweden especially, uh, sometimes you say that, oh, Sweden vote 
the same in the same way as UK does. On the other hand, you can say UK votes as uh, Sweden does in in many many decisions. So uh, we have quite often uh, we are like-minded in on how we look upon um, the union, the the power of the institutions, and uh, also on, on especially on trade issues and to have a free open market on 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 different areas regarding trade. So uh, we, uh, in many aspects, even if we are different uh, in many ways, we are uh, like-minded uh, regarding uh, often in EU decisions. And to really be able to, um, I don't think we can overlook or, or really imagine uh, a European Union uh, without UK, to be honest. So I think I, I really want, and I, well, Want, I would like to see Sweden work very hard to, to keep the uh, UK inside the Union. Uh, uh, regarding other issues that we have to, as I say, it's, it's not, there's not one quick fix or, oh, um, make one decision and then we will have, everything will go back uh, to normal because this is not, we are not in a normal stage. Uh, we are under, under pressure and I would like to go back to to, to what I mentioned in my uh, introduction, namely the fact that the core values of democracy, the rule of law, human rights, uh, gender equality, uh, and, and these very fundamental values, they are under attack, both from outside of the Union and within the Union. So uh, I would think that the answer is to go back to basics. Why are we doing this? Uh, and would we be better out on our own no, I don't think so. Thank you. Björn, yeah, what do we bring back into our research work? One word. Uh, short response. I think when, when it comes to the, the foreign policy, I, I, I don't really see that we were too upbeat about it. Uh, um, the role of the institutions, yes. I mean, we researchers spent uh, five years or something looking at the Lisbon changes and, uh, and the, the double hat, the triple hat, and what would it do. But at the end of the day, if the member states don't want to use these instruments that it created, it doesn't really matter how many hats we, we put on people down in Brussels. And I think that's really what's shown in the report as well. So I think the, the focus on, on the member state is really have some credibility here. Uh, also, I mean, it's, uh, there is a crisis, uh, mostly internal, but also external. But it's not really the, the problem, or I mean, it's not the cause of European foreign policy that Russian modernization essentially failed and it's going backwards, uh, or some of the other crises, but we'll have to deal with them, of course. I think one thing to end with is perhaps benchmarking, and I think you refer to it in the report about the kind of the years in the early 2000s when everything was just great and we had Tony Blair and Chirac, etc. I think perhaps those were some pretty exceptional years, uh, some kind of golden years where, where everything functioned with the key personalities in place, uh, institution worked rather well and we had a context that were very allowing for European foreign policy. Uh, I think that was an exception rather than the rule and we shouldn't really benchmark against those years because that's going to be painful for a long well, time. We all said we're going to get more fit, didn't we? So we benchmark from where we are now and we can hardly, almost only go up. No, that's unfortunately not true. Susie, will you give us some last thoughts. Yes, um, uh, I mean, again, um, the, I'm, I'm sorry if the conversation around the foreign policy crisis has seemed blasé. Um, uh, certainly when we're talking about an existential crisis, when we're talking about a situation in which the real story is um, the way others impact on us and our inability to impact outwards, um, I think that that, uh, that that really is a very serious crisis and um, uh, a, a moment for, for very serious reflection about um, about how we move forward from here. Um, in terms of reasons for failure, yes, we do try to um, uh, assess this as, as part of the scorecard, um, and we try to make cl uh, clear in, in the text of each component that where we're not giving a perfect score, uh, what the reasons um, are for that and, and what more would have needed to be done under unity resources um, policy design um, in order to have a different outcome. Although the reason that we do separate those things out is precisely because there are some policy areas um, like the Syria crisis where the EU has less leverage than it does perhaps on, um, uh, I don't know, the situation in Ukraine, for example. So that's why we kind of, we, we, we try to look at um, each case quite individually and quite specifically. On Syria itself, I agree with you that, um, that this is a really... Um, 
serious uh, problem that uh, that the EU has been unable to make its mark on this conflict, um, not only but obviously primarily uh, because it's a, a conflict that has destroyed the lives of uh, so many millions of people, uh, but, but also because that is now a crisis which is directly impacting at home. And that, uh, you know, if, 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 if a foreign policy strategy is for something, um, then, uh, then surely it's for mitigating against that. Um, and uh, in, 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 terms of, um, in terms of why we haven't um, done more there, I think part of it is about... Um, uh, an inability um, for, for the EU as a whole to, to strategize in what is effectively a proxy conflict. Um, it's also a problem uh, uh, that, um, that different member states are involved in different ways and willing to um, engage capital at a European level in different ways. Um, but so far, we haven't managed to work through that. I think it really is a priority for, um, for, for, for the coming weeks and months. Thank you, Susie. Thanks for the collaboration with the uh, ECFR. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to have this discussion. Thank you, audience. See you next time. Thank you.